Uh, call to order the uh, January 22nd, 2013 informational meeting of the Sioux Falls City Council. Welcome everyone who's here at Carnegie Town Hall with us this afternoon, as well as those watching live on CityLink and those watching the streaming on SiouxFalls.org. Good to have you all here. Light agenda today. We will go straight to City Council open discussion. Councilor Entman. Thank you very much. I'd like to take this opportunity, if I might. Uh, as you all know, uh, Mike Sullivan retired uh, the end of December from uh, the Sioux Falls Sports Authority. And with us today, we've got the new executive director, and we also have our project director here. Uh, Wes Hall is our new executive director of the Sioux Falls Sports Authority. And of course, Jason Richards uh, continues as the project director for the Sioux Falls Sports Authority. Wes, would you like to come forward and just kind of introduce yourself, please? Push, your push buttons. the buttons sorry. on there. I'm sorry. The red. Thank you. Both mics. I always do that to the newbie. Sorry. Okay. No, that's fine. <laughs> Not a problem. I do appreciate the opportunity to speak here today. Um, <clears throat> I am taking over as the executive director of the Sioux Falls Sports Authority uh, for Mike Sullivan, who is in much warmer climates right now down in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, this is an exciting opportunity. Um, I'm coming up from Iowa. I spent the past six years down in Iowa helping to direct a small bicycle event called Rag Bride. You may have heard of that. Um, prior to that, I am born and raised in Virginia, so you will hear a little bit of a southern twang in my dialect. But it is an exciting time here in Sioux Falls. Um, looking forward to the opportunities we do have here uh, in the near future and for future years, for future years uh, coming down the road. So we have a lot planned, and I look forward to working with each one of you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Welcome to Sioux Falls. Thank you. It's not always this cold. Sometimes it's colder. <laughs> Other open discussion items from council. I do have one for us. I asked um, Jim David, our legislative operations manager, he sent a copy of a letter to each of us today in regard to Senate Bill 51 that has been introduced in the South Dakota legislature. And, and uh, we just wanted to talk a little bit about whether um, it is something that the Munis South Dakota Municipal League is opposing and whether the Sioux Falls City Council wants to become involved in uh, publicly opposing it. And so, Jim, would you walk us through that draft of the letter that um, is also available on your desks? Sure. Yep. Uh, Senate Bill 51 has the potential to cost uh, all municipalities in the state of South Dakota one and a half million. It has the potential to cost uh, the city of Sioux Falls or impact their budget by about $440,000. And what this has to do with is something called a collection allowance credit. Uh, back in 2006, the South Dakota legislature passed a bill that would allow retailers to be reimbursed for the expense that they have in paying or remitting their sales tax money to the Department of Revenue. And they passed this bill, uh, had a maximum amount of $70 per retailer. So if you were a large retailer, the most you can get is $70. You can even get less, especially if you don't have as many sales. The, the governor at that time, Governor Rounds, had vetoed that bill, and the South Dakota legislature overrode that veto. And so this has been in place. And this is scheduled to take place when $10 million in Internet sales are taken in. Well, under seven, Senate Bill 51, that has changed. It's now January 1st of 2014 when this would begin. And prior to, or right now in current law, the funding mechanism or the funding source uh, for, this, uh, for this credit is actually state revenue. Under 51, it expands to city sales tax money or city sales revenue. So Senate Bill 51 expands that to the city of Sioux Falls. We did include a letter uh, that could be sent on your behalf opposing uh, this bill. And I would welcome any comments, changes, or anything else. Questions from council regarding this proposal? Any, um, yeah, I see shaking of heads and that's kind of my response too was, okay, great. Um, any objection to council sending this, signing it? Leadership could just sign it and get it going. Thoughts, Councilor Rolfing? Well, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to get my arms around this. It should be simple, but it, maybe I've been gone too long or whatever. But so they've got a million, million or 1.5%, which says that, um, and 1.5 million. 
this is a refund this is a, a collection a collection fee that is refunded to it would come the, out of our budget to the that retailers would now come out of our budget instead of theirs that's right. what it amounts right. to exactly and yep. um, they're thinking that's a yeah I can see them thinking that's a good deal mm -hmm. and uh, yeah I think we should uh, get together and uh, get these printed or we should send them individually or whatever okay um, um, Councilor Agu um, Jim do you want to respond yeah response? well it, uh, Madam Chair I, uh, one other thing is that for the first year it's going to be all retailers would qualify for this but in year two and thereafter the only retailers that qualify for this are those that are going to file electronically so it is an incentive to get more and more retailers to file electronically so the impact in the first year is going to be 440,000 this is again this information is from the Department of Revenue so it could be higher it could be lower um, but that is going to probably change year two going out so okay. Councilor Aguilar I was just wondering if the administration is going to take a stand on this if they're going to I, don't know. I we see didn't talk director Cherbeck and Tracy, I, could you I know that you have privately said to municipal league your that's, feelings. that's correct I think I copied you on my communication in the municipal municipal league uh, in in opposition to the Senate bill 51 so I, I certainly concur with the, uh, the the writing of this letter and the, and the uh, position that, that the council would be taking by sending this letter I, th I think it's spot on okay uh, how about then if we like this letter how about we ask the mayor to sign it and possibly uh, then I could sign it as council chair on our behalf so that it would move out of here faster and then you can take that um, I think that there's also an email that lists the sponsors and some of the folks that have signed on are local yes yep and I could send that out to the entire council that has members of the appropriations committee many of whom actually represent the city of Sioux Falls and the surrounding area and I would pass it out to the full council so that I would encourage you then to do your own personal lobbying as well as this group any other thoughts comments I'm not I don't want to shove this through but I'm just feeling like that's where we're headed okay so Jim I'm gonna ask you then to draft this so that it can be signed by both the mayor and myself okay. and we'll just go forward all right well thank you thank you if you have questions council members um, if there's something that's bugging you later on you think of it please um, get with Jim about it or email him so Yes, Councilor Antman. Um, I might also say that last week I was in Pierre attending the tour Governor's Tourism Council, but I also had an opportunity on Thursday to testify before the Taxation Committee on House Bill 1066, was, which was eliminating the sunset clause of the half-cent tourism tax. Uh, if you didn't read it in the newspaper, it did come out of committee. I believe it was 14 to 1, 14 in favor of it, and it did pass the House on Friday significantly with only four dissenting votes so now it goes on to the Senate so hopefully uh, we will see some action on that and, and, and we're encouraged by it I think it's very important that we keep that it's the funding mechanism for advertising and promotion for the tourism department and 77 percent of that half cent tax is actually paid by visitors from out of state uh, and it's a key financing source for the Department of Tourism mm -hmm. great thank you thanks for representing all of us there too other items for open discussion from council okay lots going on all right let's move forward with presentations the monthly event center project update mark cotter from public works is going to start us off welcome good afternoon council chair and council members mark cotter with the office of public works today we'll take the opportunity to update you on the event center um, there's four presenters here today. Kendra Simmons, one of the project manager, and Jason Marinowski with Mortensen is here as well. So we'll take you through the information, and if you have questions at the end, we'll work to answer them. Before we move into the presentations, I just want you to look at the current rendering that's in front of you. We'll start to uh, focus a little bit later today on one of the first vertical elements that's going up on site and what's being the pointed at right now. Those are what we call the vertical stair towers uh, inside them are the stairs also the elevators um, and there are also some of the main utility chases to get utilities from the lower floor to the upper floor um, we often refer to them as the upside down U because there's there's two vertical elements and then there's a connector so they're not only an architectural element but they're very functional and you'll start to see those come up on site first Okay, next slide. 
All right, today, uh, in January, marks the seventh month of construction. As you look at the site today on the webcam, you can see that the site's been secured, um, the asphalt's been removed, the foundation systems are in, and if you're outside close, you'll see a lot of conduits that are sticking up out of the ground. They're a lot of times painted to make sure that they don't, uh, so that people can clearly see them. But those are all the utilities that will serve this facility, and there's a number of them if you get a chance to go out there. Um, it's the water, storm drainage, roof drainage, sanitary sewer, electrical. Private utilities are also coming on site with uh, the gas service. So a lot of those sort of bones are now in place with the site being prepared, the complete foundation system in, and the utilities ready um, for the vertical elements to start. Some of those upcoming vertical elements that we've got some pictures of is the first of the four stair towers is currently being erected. Um, very soon, in early February, we'll start to see structural steel arrive on site, and that will ultimately support this 105-foot tall structure. Um, then there's horizontal concrete crews that will uh, closely follow the work, and that is, um, that's, that's the actual concrete that's poured on the event level, but also on this in series of concourses. And so a very clockwise fashion as the steel is erected, so will the concrete um, that gets poured horizontally. Those crews will follow right behind them. So you'll start to see a lot of work happen now in 2013. And then horizontal precast stadia um, or treads and risers that will be inside the building that ultimately is where the, um, that forms the bowl. Those will start to come uh, later this year. This just gives you a picture inside Gage Brothers uh, in town where some of the first precast elements are being um, set up and poured. This is, this is a form that's been set up. If you look at um, that area that's being pointed to, when you walk up close to the precast, um, we've got an architectural element called Jasper Stone, that uh, dimension Jasper, uh, because not only will these stair towers be viewed on the inside, but they're also viewed on the outside. And that was one of those elements that we wanted to pull in from Sioux Falls and incorporate. So some of those Jasper Stone inlays um, are shown there that will get incorporated into that pour. This is another slide at Gage Brothers that sets up some of the rebar and the connection steel as they start to build these like Legos. Uh, ultimately, um, that's some of that rebar work that you'll see. And then here's a pour that's happening um, at Gage Brothers. And we've been receiving precast uh, out there for over two weeks now, uh, and, and those elements are starting to go up. Okay, so here is one, here's that element of that northwest um, uh, stair tower. It's the first of four stair towers that's going up. And essentially they build them like um, Legos where you just one piece at a time. If you look close, you see the different um, horizontal bands. That's the jasper inlay that those, that stone gets actually inset and cast with that panel. Um, and as you either look at it on the website, on the other side, you'll start to see the doors and the elevator uh, openings um, for each respective floor. So finally, we can see some vertical elements after a lot of uh, foundation work has been put in place. I wanted to just bring, you, uh, bring one element of give you a sense of what happens on a very routine basis um, when you hire someone like Mortensen to organize and coordinate the work. Uh, this is what they call an integrated work plan. Um, one of the things that we were impressed with when we hired Mortensen is that they've got a, they've got a very organized system um, that essentially takes um, all the contract documents for one scope of work, um, takes any submittals that have come in, and they create a one-sheet um, piece of information for that scope of work. Uh, in what traditionally happens is you'll see submittals, um, you'll see specifications, you'll see plan sheets, and the crews in the field have to, you know, make sure that all those things are respectively referenced when they go to the field, so it's a little cumbersome. This really streamlines uh, that. Uh, gives people, the foreman and the, and the crews that are on site, one sheet to look at so they have a full understanding of where they can work, 
um, and what's included. And they're essentially set up to really ensure safety, quality, uh, and production. As you look at the site, um, as you look at this layout, on the right-hand side really speaks to what the crew size will be. This one is one that they sat down and, and built with Fegan. Uh, it lists the materials, the tools, the safety, the production schedules in the lower left. Gives a profile view in this case. Uh, these are precast shear walls, so the gray, air, the gray area in that profile um, that's essentially what the work is. It's setting that precast um, shear wall. And then in the upper left, that's the erection schedule. So again, just kind of boils all that information to one. And there's many, many, many of these that are generated. But it really allows Mortensen and the subcontractor to control the work and, and, and do it in a safe environment. All right, today we have a short 40 model that's been updated and along the bottom you'll see as that dial tra moves from left to right that's the schedule and we'll progress here this work that you're seeing that is the foundation system that's been put in place one of the requirements that we asked of the constructor and the subcontractors is that they had uh, BIM modeling um, this is a really good coordination tool, but it's also a really good as-built tool for us. So those elements are going in. Those are the foundation systems for the building. Now you'll start to see that vertical stair tower. That's essentially where we're at today with uh, with the build of that. The next one they'll move to is the other one on the north-hand side near the loading docks. And they'll move to the uh, other side. Now you start to see the structural steel go up. That starts on the north side and goes around counterclockwise. And very soon, those big blocks of blue, now gray, that is that horizontal concrete that they'll start to pour right behind the steel erectors. So it can be a very organized fashion uh, as it starts to move around. There'll be a, a lot of work uh, done and seen in 2013. Here's the precast stadia or those treads and risers that ultimately form the bowl that the seats get bolted to. Uh, all the subs have a respective area to work in. And then once you see those large cranes um, on that end, you'll start to see some of the roof trusses come in. The outside, that blue area, that is the outside metal sheathing or the uh, architectural elements and the windows. There's some of the roof that's going in on those lower, on those lower roofs. And then here's those large um, roof trusses being set one at a time. You notice on the west end there's been a leave out area so they can get the crane out of the building. So there's that. Build the roof out. Um, as they're leaving, and if you had a glance down on schedule, this is about October of 2013 at this point. Still working on the outside envelope with the uh, architectural metal windows while there's a number of activities happening on the inside. And there's the roof. So by December of 13, uh, our project schedule has us having the building erected and roofed. Okay. Okay, next slide is um, some website updates. We're getting close to adding uh, more recent photos. We got our first time lapse video. We've hired Vision Video locally um, to actually kind of net out what's happened in the first six months. And we'll put that on there and in about a 30 second time period, you can see the site go from what we knew it to be um, to fenced off, site prepared, and, and to where we're at today. The 4D model that we just looked at, um, and also the subcontractors that have been awarded work per scope of work or functional class um, are also on the website that people can check out. Next one. All right, now I'd like to bring up uh, Darren Smith to give you an update on premium seating.
Good afternoon, Darren Smith, Director of Community Development. Uh, just a brief uh, update on uh, premium seating and, and sponsorship product sales. A uh, couple things to touch on. Uh, as a reminder, I think you all know we hired Legend Sales and Marketing, a uh, professional sales firm who specializes in this kind of uh, effort to come in and sell the premium seating and sponsorship products for not only the new event center, but also the existing convention center uh, and existing arena. And they moved a full-time staff person uh, that they've assigned to this project into Sioux Falls. His name is Ryan Query. Uh, Ryan uh, and what was his fiance when he moved to town, now it's his wife. Uh, they were married in December. So Ryan's got lots of things going on in his life. It's an exciting time. But uh, they have settled in. They're in Sioux Falls. And uh, Ryan has been fully engaged really since late October in this project locally uh, in a number of different ways along with other, um, other legend staff. Uh, the other uh, thing that's very important is we do have them in an office at the convention center, uh, which is very important. It was something they definitely wanted to be on site, so to speak, with the project. It's something we wanted. We all agree will lead to a better uh, uh, sales and marketing effort. So as of January 1st, give or take, uh, they have a small space in the convention center. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you to SMG for, for accommodating that. But uh, that, that'll be very helpful going forward. In terms of what they have been doing, uh, as you know, we've been talking about this for a little while now. They've been engaged really for, again, the last two or three months, uh, diligently engaged in that uh, market analysis locally. A number of different tools, um, online survey work, uh, reaching out to literally a few thousand uh, organizations and individuals, um, all kinds of conversations, phone, email, and so forth, as word gets out that this effort is ramping up and they're the ones doing it uh, when we get communications when we receive those and we still do we really have for the last two years we forward all of those to them and they follow up and uh, all of that goes into helping them determine a couple things first of all uh, do we have the right inventory in terms of number of suites loge boxes club seats and so forth and then uh, uh, what those packages look like the amenities associated with each the pricing levels and so forth they should be wrapping that up very soon and then the third and final bullet point, what all of that leads to is the first product, so to speak, that will go on sale for this building, other than the naming rights on the building, which you know we've already done. The next thing will be suite sales. And I would fully expect that to start in earnest as early as next month. And then that'll lead to other premium seating products in the months uh, to come, as well as sponsorships in there as well. That is my update. I know we'll, have, uh, we'll take our questions later. Um, at this time, I will introduce Mike Cooper. Thanks, Darren. Mike Cooper, Planning and Building Services. I want to give you a few quick updates in terms of operations with our project. As you remember, last year we put together a committee to coordinate parking for some of the major events that happened, uh, particularly at Howardwood Field during the October-November time period. We're going to do that again this year to begin looking at March events because that's going to be probably the busiest month before we get into the summer lull. Uh, just to give you an idea of what's coming up this year in March, the first week in March, both the convention center and arena will be used for the sportsman show. They'll be back again. The second week in March, the convention center will be booked with the Home Builders Association show. And then the arena at the same time will have the Summit League tournament. And then the third week in March at the convention center, we'll have the lawn and garden show going on concurrently with the South Dakota High School AA Boys Tournament at the arena. So those will be the big events in March that we want to make sure that we have our parking issues figured out. And then Mark guarantees that we won't have to worry about snow removal during those weeks. So that'll be a big part of it as well. Another item that we've been working on uh, if you recall, part of our master plan for the parking facility is to work with the Sioux Falls School District on two things. Across the street on the west side of, of Western, at the corner of Madison and Western, there's a vacant corner that the school district has been keeping in reserve for future parking. And with the event center, they have agreed to allow us to bump up the time frame of that and as part of our project, we'll be constructing a parking lot at that corner that will be approximately 60 parking spaces, off-street parking spaces. And then on the north side of our site, 
um, adjacent to the Russell Street frontage road on the south side, there'll be an additional parking area of about 124 parking spaces that will also involve some of the school district property. So we're gonna be bringing to you an agreement the first part of February that the Sioux Falls School Board has already approved that will allow us to construct those two parking areas as part of our overall project budget. And in return, the school district will allow us to use those during their off school regular hours of operation. The transition between um, SMG Global Spectrum to take over the convention center began at the beginning of this year. Uh, we actually had a, an event on New Year's Eve that went past midnight. So that was kind of interesting to see if the staff changed their shirts from Global Spectrum to SMG, but I don't think it happened that way. It was a very smooth transition uh, in terms of SMG taking over the convention center. And of course, Ovations is now in charge of the food and beverage for not only the convention center, but also for the arena and Orpheum. Uh, some of the recent changes that have been made, particularly on the food and beverage side, is that Ovations has started to look at the menu and pricing and looking at potential future changes, but they wanted to wait until the hockey football seasons are over before they come back with any recommended changes. But for now, they have been looking at making changes to the current uh, menu items that are being offered at the arena. Almost all the menu items that we offer have been upgraded, including providing different size portions, uh, looking at the quality of the food that we have available. One example is that they now have their own slow roasted pulled pork for sandwiches versus the pork that was brought in from an outside vendor. They've made changes to the concession stand to help streamline the cleaning and, and improve sanitation. They've also made improvements to the placement of the product for greater visibility and presentation with the idea of increasing the sales. And so far, some of the preliminary indications that we've had from the few events that have been conducted since the first of the year is that our per cap sales, we believe, are up from what they have been in the past. But uh, we're going to be waiting to provide with you with more information until we've had some additional events that Ovations has, has been able to uh, oversee. So the preliminary indications are very positive. And when Ovations came in and they came up here, when you approved the contract that we could proceed ahead with them, the indication was, the commitment was, that they were going to be looking at the quality of food, uh, the more variety of menu items, more local food products, and they are uh, already beginning to, to take those in stride. The last thing that I'll mention is from an operational standpoint, we've had discussions internally and we are now moving forward with a change in terms of our oversight of the operations, the contracts with SMG and Ovations. That responsibility of the contract administration is being transferred from planning to finance. So Tracy Turbeck will now be overseeing from the administration side uh, with his team the contract administration for both SMG and Ovations. And with that, I'm going to bring Tracy up to talk to you about uh, the finance update. Thank you, Mike. I don't know about you, but all he had to do was say slow roasted pulled pork and my stomach started growling. But, uh, <laughs> it, it certainly is a good example of the, the benefit that we have of, of one food and beverage service provider having access to all the facilities. So that's something that they can do now that they've got uh, the arena benefits from, from uh, Ovations having the kitchen facilities in the convention center. So that's, uh, that's uh, certainly another good thing that's coming out of uh, that combined uh, effort. The financial summary uh, in terms of the project funding, of course, that hasn't changed. Uh, we're still looking at $117 million combined project funding uh, when we include both the public and private funds for the project. On the, uh, the lower part of the slide, the expenditures, uh, as I've been uh, telling you to expect, the construction spending is picking up pace. Um, 
We're, we've seen uh, about five million dollars now spent on the the uh, building itself. Uh, another 1.1 million on the offsite improvements. That's primarily the the uh, sanitary sewer improvements offsite that have uh, been necessary for the to accommodate the the facility. Uh, and of course, the the professional fees. Uh, we'll see those start to taper off and f uh, flatten out now uh, as we. Uh, are nearly completed with the design work and so that'll be more into a, a monitoring uh, of the construction activity going forward so uh, we're, we'll see that construction number grow significantly uh, as Mark has, has talked about the we're, we're out of the ground now and we're seeing some uh, vertical improvements and and as some of those uh, pick up pay, uh, pick up the pace we'll see the, the that reflected in this financial summary uh, in the future as well so uh, with that, that is our, our update for today. Uh, we're on a new schedule now, as you folks are aware, and on every other month uh, update. So our next update will be on the 26th of March. Uh, we'll be back, and I'm sure we all stand ready for any questions you have today. Thank you. Great. Thank you all. Council members, questions for the group? Councilor Jameson? Three questions, if I could. <clears throat> Probably Darren, maybe, I guess, the first one here. Given that uh, next month you'll be selling the suites, where are we at on, on the lease agreements with the Stampede and the Storm? Well, I think that would be a better question. I don't want to put Tracy on the spot, but uh, oh. as Mike mentioned earlier, that really will be his okay. area going forward because SMG will be doing that. Um, I don't know that he has a lot to contribute right now today, but I'll give him that opportunity. Yeah, there, there really isn't a lot to report. I know SMG has been in contact with both teams, and of course, it, as our facility manager, that is SMG's responsibility to kind of lead that effort on the city's behalf. So uh, we certainly expect that to, uh, to become more active, I guess, in the, in the weeks to come so that we can uh, address that early on. I think that's key to, to the effort that, that Darren is leading with, uh, with the help of Legends to, to sell our, our premium seating so that's, that's certainly a, an important issue going forward in the, in the near future. Okay, very good. Then how about the uh, guaranteed maximum price? Is there a timeline for us to receive that? I think you've said it over and over again, but I didn't hear it today, so I thought I'd get an update if I could. Uh, we're still, I don't have a timeline for you, but we are, uh, we're working through what we consider the assumptions and clarification step of that. We've you know, we understand one of the things that's very important when you um, agree to the guaranteed maximum price, what we agree to is, is what's included in that, and if it's not, then um, there will be a change order associated with that. So we're just double-checking through the assumptions and clarifications, uh, back-checking with specifications and plans, um, and so I can certainly give you an update on that when, um, when we get together with the project team. Maybe how much of the job is bid? Already, is it 80 percent? Oh yeah, it's a strong 80. Uh, probably uh, north of 80 percent has been procured. So some of the guesswork will be really probably taken out of it when most of it's bid out. You'll pretty well have it all figured out then. Right. So, uh, you know, one of the considerations is when you start, um, you know, bidding schedules of work as they get designed, but then other designs are occurring uh, at, at a point in time. Mm -hmm both the owner and the constructor have to say, okay, let's, let's lock in this guaranteed maximum price. You have to reconcile all that work that's happened because they just don't one day print off plans and then say, okay, here's, here's the guaranteed maximum price. It's, uh, it's a very in-depth process to make sure that um, the entire project team knows, the owner and the constructor knows what's exactly included in that guaranteed maximum price, um, but we're very close. We're very close. I just remember that as a big selling point to this whole process is that, but if after it's all bid out, it doesn't hardly make, give us the whole benefit of a guaranteed maximum price if it's kind of, but either way. Right, no, that's uh, it's a fair question. It's uh, The key is, is what's included in that so um, we can net out what is in the plans and specs and then ultimately uh, manage the construction from that point forward. But again, we're managing under 117 million dollars and we'll bring it in at that. If you could stay, I guess, I think this last one's for you probably. Um, will, we need to, will we need to pay for the parking lots, the new parking lots? 
Uh, the ones that Mike mentioned? Yes. Yes, those were a part of our original project plan. Well, they were. And actually, the one that Mike mentioned that's, uh, that parallels Russell Street, uh, the school district uh, really likes that idea. And so if you drive out there, they actually started using that area um, because they knew that we were going to tear it up. And so with some of the larger events, they would have, like, their officials park there. Um, we've actually put some millings down. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's available space that can expand. Some of that uh, track and, and band parking will, you know, they'll see a benefit from that as well. So and it's going to coordinate nice with the Russell Street improvements that gets bid on February 20th. So a lot of work happening out there, and they were all included in the 117. Okay. Other questions for the group? Wonderful. Thank you all. We'll see you again on March 26th regarding this particular topic. Remind you that SiouxFalls.org slash event center is the place to see all this interesting information that's happening. Anything else from council this afternoon? Reminder that we are headed to Canton at 7 o'clock to do zoning work with our fellow elected officials in Lincoln County. So we'll meet you there at 7. And uh, we do not meet next week. Yes, Councilor Rolfing. Well, I, um, I think it's appropriate, I guess, to uh, say that we have one of our more respected, uh, m very respected people who uh, is going to be buried tomorrow in Don Benham. And I, I think it would be appropriate to just say, Thank you to him and all that he's done for the city of Sioux Falls and, uh, and just uh, hope his family is, is doing well and uh, we wish him our best and our condolences are out to, uh, to the family and, and uh, thank you again yeah. for all that he's done for this city over the years. Yep. Thank you. Good reminder that uh, many folks are involved in the processes of making Sioux Falls what it is, and he was one of those critical pieces. And so, yes, thanks to him, thanks to his family, and our prayers and blessings with them. Anything else for the group? Wow. All right. I'm going to adjourn this meeting. Thank you all very much.